there was this idea that you can learn any programming language um, by solving like problems on lit code, for example. So he believed that uh, ternary operator just does not belong to Kotlin. It's not needed. So well, this is what you're talking about, right? Like fu fundamental learning. Yes. So you learn, and then of course you apply. As well, it's it, it it's all known for 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 ages. You've learned something, you've applied it, you solved some problems which were tailored specifically to this particular stuff that you've learned, and then you learn something else on top of that. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. And today we're speaking about programming languages and learning them with Vitaly Bregelevsky, developer advo advocate at JetBrains and um, an author of the book uh, Haskell in Depth. Uh, welcome, Vitaly. Hi, hi folks, hi everyone. So let, let's, uh, let's go ahead. So today we're talking about uh, programming languages, learning them, teaching them. And in order to understand why we're talking with Vitaly, I would I would like to ask him like, what is your background? Why why programming languages? Well, uh, it all starts many years ago. <laughs> I I learned my first programming languages, uh, which were uh, Fortran and Pascal. Uh, well, it was 1995, almost 30 years ago. And then, of course, I learned a lot of programming languages. And for 20 years, I was working as a, a lecturer at a university, teaching others programming languages. And um, during my career in education, I think I uh, taught like maybe uh, 20 different programming languages. So it's it's quite a lot. So I used them, I uh, taught them, and. Um, I was interested in many programming languages and uh, I was deeply interested in Haskell. And for Haskell, I was not only writing a book, but uh, I was also a member of uh, uh, Glasgow Haskell uh, Compiler Steering Committee, the committee which uh, governs the development of Haskell and Haskell Compiler for several years. Um, I was also... Uh, learning a lot about compilers so programming language implementation so yeah and and then i also uh, uh was a teacher in a computer school for children teaching them uh, programming languages as well and programming in general so yeah i i know a thing or two about programming languages uh like how many haskell programmers it takes to change a bulb well uh yeah, I, I don't have the, the, the precise answer for that. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I, I think the answer like, is like none because like, the bulb is mutable, right? <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you know what? Like, the, like those uh, jokes about Haskell. Um, when you uh, learn Haskell like for real, uh, you know that it's a general purpose programming language. So you can <laughs> do whatever you want in Haskell. Like, for example, you can uh, implement in-play sort, like with all oh, the immutability, with everything. So, you can, well, you can do everything in any programming language. So, you just need to learn it properly. Okay, okay. That, that's, a, that's a matter of learning. Okay, got it. Like, your experience sparks uh, interesting questions. For example, like, I, I don't think there are a lot of people who know how actually languages are developed and evolve, right? Can you provide some perspective on how it actually happens? Well, I think it's uh, uh, for for every programming language, it's uh, very very different. Like there there are languages with a single or a very small group of developers responsible for everything. There are uh, like committee style uh, committee developed languages, languages designed and developed by a committee. When there there is a group of folks who uh, are into uh, taking decisions about where to go, like which keyword to develop, which concepts to support and stuff like that. There are languages with a sort of a chaotic development when there are contributors uh, on GitHub and then they implement certain features. 
So it, it's very different, actually. And of course, it's good for a programming language to have a, an established process to, uh, to wait different decisions, to decide on what to do, which feature should be implemented now, which feature should never be implemented, even if it's extremely popular and ex requested by so many folks. Uh, language designers may come up with a decision not to implement that because it, this feature, uh, some feature may be somehow like uh, not appropriate for high level language design. So it, it's all very is different. It, yeah, is it a case for a ternary operator in Kotlin? Well, that's something <laughs> I had in mind. Yes, that's true. And so, I, I think I think it's it's not my answer actually. So Andre Brislav was talking precisely about that. So he believed that uh, ternary operator just does not belong to Kotlin. It's not needed. So yeah, a lot of folks think that uh, it hurts maintainability because people tend to create those trees of ternary operator, <laughs> and indeed it, it turns into a mess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the problem is that almost any feature can be uh, abused in this or another way. So unfortunately, uh, developers tend to uh, use features wrong, in the wrong way. That's so true. language designers try to avoid that, but it's almost never possible to avoid like every case of abuse for yeah. programming language features. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think it's extremely hard to design some things, uh, especially in programming languages that are supposed to work in a certain way and then people will come up with very creative ways how to how to abuse it or misuse it or yeah that, that, that's yeah that, that, that's interesting or maybe so, or, or maybe mm -hmm. to people can also come up with uh, great ways to use this feature something that was not known to designer something that was not expected but actually turned out to be a very great thing to have in the language uh, do, do you have an example of that um well, it's, um, you, you know, like in Haskell, they have this uh, concept of monad. And the original uh, thing for it was to um, distinguish pure computation and computation with side effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, so rather simple one. But then uh, uh, after years of development, years of implementing um, libraries, we realized that it's possible to do just just a, a huge pile of stuff can be done using this very concept. So it turned out extremely important for the programming language, like in general. So I I don't immediately remember any examples for other programming languages, but it's definitely possible. I, I wonder if uh, like I don't know companion objects, for example, are used in a particular way in, in Kotlin, like for you know for constants or like methods in class or or anything. But <laughs> I I I personally don't like companion objects. I think that it's uh, like solution to like. Well, they try to avoid certain stuff from Java. They try to avoid repeating stuff from Java. So they've they've come up with this idea, but I'm not a big fan of it. So you can use it for different things, of course. But maybe somewhere like in the realm of ideas, programming language design ideas, there is something much better that should that is yet to be discovered and implement it in a language. Okay, okay. So you, you think Kotlin should have uh, stick to, you know, just providing con uh, constants there in the, the classes? Yeah, maybe. May I, I, I just, I, I don't have an opinion on, on, on this particular solution. But, uh, well, uh, important thing is that uh, any programming language is a uh, work in progress. Mm -hmm. Once it stopped uh, developing, it just it, it it very quickly it becomes useless. So we are we are used to uh, programming languages in development. So that's why there are always problem, and then there are folks who are trying to come up with the new solutions for those problems. And this is like very regular thing in programming languages. What language do you think is the most important for learning today? Well, there there is no single language the most important for learning. I always thought that uh, it's uh, very beneficial to know more than one programming language, to learn more than one programming language, because they are 
so different. They uh, allow us to apply so different techniques, to learn uh, different ways of uh, solving problems. So it's, it's crucial to know many of them. You can start with anything like Python, which is extremely popular these days for solving like everyday problems or well, actually any problem. Uh, then you can learn something which is low level, which uh, has direct memory access and uh, maybe with some level of control that can be like Rust or C or C++ or Zeek, whatever. Uh, then it's also beneficial to learn something which uh, has uh, a managed memory like C Sharp or uh, Java or Kotlin. And then, of course, it's useful to have something like to have skills in something like functional programming language like Haskell or uh, OCaml or maybe F Sharp, uh, something like that. So it's useful to learn more than one programming language, that's for sure. And then it's, it's not necessary to apply every technique you know in any programming language, of course. Because if you do that, then your code is quickly becoming a mess. Like, well, you try to use all the concepts you've learned from all the programming languages, and then it's just something no one could understand. But uh, still, if you have this, these skills, if you have the knowledge of those features, then you can think how you can maybe uh, apply them in another programming language and maybe come up with a better solution. Okay, but but still, like uh, you gave a variety of languages, but what? Let's say, what are the top three? Oof. Well, well, you know, I, I I don't want to give recommendations like that. They they are mostly useless. Like you know, the like the the right answer actually. So start or learn languages which are the easiest to learn for you. Okay. So if you have access to some educational materials, or even better, if you have access to forks who actually are experts in this or that programming language, maybe it's better to stick with this programming language because then you will have uh, good access to like living learning resource, which is okay. extremely helpful. I, I, I mean, today you have like plenty of free courses like Free Code Camp or Coursera or Udemy or like pick your favorite uh, learning platform. Then you have these AI companions that can explain you something like chat GPT, a llama model, whatever. Then there are tons of programmers online that are happy to help with the Stack Overflow sites and, and so on and so on. I mean, we're living in a time where this access to educational material is free, constant and like likely of a high quality, right? So you, well, you don't need to, to have a neighbor programmer <laughs> who will help you. Well, you know, uh, there is some problem with that. So when you have uh, a lot of materials, the, the main problem for you is to choose, to find, to, 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 to select something that you actually, that, that will be meaningful for you. And no AI assistant can uh, answer, well, it, it can answer everything, of course, but we can question the, its answers. So, well... It's it's very difficult. So you need to have a teacher, I believe, like or someone who, uh, someone who you can trust. Uh, do, do you think? Yeah. Do, do you think it's possible to learn just out of a book? Uh, like uh, sharing my experience, uh, how I learned uh, uh, programming. Like of course, I had teachers uh, for Logo and Pascal in school, but then what I did, I just bought uh, this uh, Podbelsky and Famine book about C programming languages, and they basically studied it and learned this um, pointers, arithmetic, and how the memory works, uh, how, how data structures works, and, and, and so on and so on. So that, that was my teacher. So is it, is it still possible in 2024 to do the same? Well, of course it's possible. Learning from books is possible for thousands of years. So, of course it's possible now. No, uh, no, 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 no. Just 500 years, actually. <laughs> Why do you think so? Like in wow. ancient Greece, uh, oh, okay, well, okay, it, it was possible. Or maybe, maybe those books they didn't look like what we have now. Yeah. But, uh, well, still, they, it they, they had scrolls like like magicians. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it, it's basically you read something 
and then you try to get some information of uh, from what you read so well of course it's possible it it, it may be difficult uh, more difficult but that mostly depends on the person in question so i think it's uh, like this was always the case and this is the case now like some people learn better from uh, uh visual materials from uh audio materials from uh videos or from uh, reading so it's it depends on the person and there are all sorts of persons these days so learners can uh, some learners can benefit from reading others can benefit from uh video tutorials on youtube and that's perfectly normal it's it, it, it's better to combine different materials of course to just to find what works better for you so yeah it's it, it it's it's possible to uh, learn coding one you know one one issue is that uh, if we are looking for programming language books uh, very often they are books for learning programming languages but not programming itself and this is a little bit different stuff so you need to find the book which actually teaches you how to write code how to solve problems and not how to use programming language features uh, let, let, that... yeah yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk about that so basically you can either learn how to um how to solve a problem or what tools do you have well, yeah, that's that's basically it. But uh, if you if you have a tool and you want to solve some problems, then that means that you have to understand that this is a problem that is uh, that should be solved. And uh, like having a tool does not necessarily mean you know how to use that tool and uh, uh, which part of the tool you need. There was this idea that you can learn any programming language uh, by solving like problems on lit code, for example. And then the, the, the issue is that uh, if you just learned a couple of features, then you can attempt to solve any problem with those features. Mm -hmm. So you don't need full-blown programming language for solving lit code problems. And that's an issue. So if you are dedicated to learning a programming language, then of course you have to, like, to put restrictions. Like today, I am... Uh, I don't know, I'm uh, learning Rust iterators, so I will try to solve this problem using this particular language feature. But that, when you do that, you need this uh, understanding of different tools, different parts of programming languages, or different features that you can apply, so uh, it requires some uh, prior knowledge. And when you learn how to solve problems, you just... Uh, use uh, different uh, and uh, other skills so you need to like to uh, write your problem in uh, programming language you need to come up with an algorithm and those algorithms they can usually be implemented in in all programming languages with uh, all sorts of features you can apply i don't know like write a lot of uh, classes and apply full-blown object-oriented solution to that or you can just avoid everything and use functions and that's it so so yeah those are different things so you just uh, so you need to understand what are you doing right now are you learning programming or are you learning problem solving using programming or are you learning programming language its features so if you understand that well that's fine you can you can use whatever works better for you. So the idea is to combine like both approaches to learn both uh, both the tools that you have and approaches yep, how to use those tools to solve the problems. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's quite an inter interesting perspective that you can actually solve the lead code problems with knowing very little about about the language itself and using like three I don't know three four basic things like uh, cycles, conditions, and uh, I don't know like. Uh, basic operators and, and that's it so, yeah. you know it's uh, it's the, the same thing is that when you choose a programming language for using at uh, job interview for example mm -hmm. one one my friend uh, told me once that he always uses just simplified c++ no okay. matter the the actual position 
like mm -hmm. simplified C++ without like standard library, mostly without uh, the containers, ma mainly uh, without mm -hmm. uh, um, diff 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 difficult algorithms. So just, just using basic C++ syntax. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because it's easier to come up with a solution that way. Like if you are working with other programming language, which is more sophisticated, then you have to solve all sorts of other problems. Like if you're working with Haskell, you have to like have have your way around uh, immutability, for example. Mm. Sometimes it's easier to use mutable uh, data structures to solve problems. So you just go with the language which allows that. So it, it it's the same thing. So you, you can be limited with uh, restricted with uh, your tool, but then solve any problem. But of course, if you apply your knowledge like in practice, if you're writing uh, industrial level application, then of course you have to use your programming language features in full and not just come up with some solution. What is the most effective strategy of learning nowadays? Like we, we iterated on all the resources that uh, you have, like you mentioned that it's important to have kind of a mentor or a person that you can consult with, right? So what to do if you if you want to learn a new language today? If you already know some other programming language, then of course it's it's easier. So if you learn your second or third programming language, uh, I would usually recommend to uh, have a problem in mind that you are going to solve. So you learn and uh, and it, it's not necessarily like a lead code problem. It can be a like, pet project implemented in a new programming language. Well, you know, the, the biggest problem here is that uh, you're trying to write code doing something. And instead of trying to come up with a system, with system of uh, like in knowledge of uh, about this programming language, you just try to find solutions to particular uh, parts of your problem. Like how yeah. to uh, sort the list and then you just mm -hmm. Google it or ask AI assistant and then you go the solution and then you just copy it. And then as a result, you've got no understanding what's going on. So this yeah, is that's... something that should be avoided when you learn programming languages. Maybe it's okay when you your goal is to solve problem, to fix issue or implement some new feature. Maybe it's mm -hmm. okay to copy a solution, but when you learn something, it's not. It's definitely not okay. So you have to understand everything what you are doing. Yeah, so what what do you do? Like uh, you see you see the problem, you're trying something like or or for example, you find a a, a piece of code that solves this particular part of the problem, like source in the list. What do you do then? You like uh, open open the documentation, see how how it is implemented, or open source code, or post a question on Stack Overflow. Or pick up a book and find uh, the chapter with the description. Like, what do you do? Well, wrong order. You said, well, you have this frag code fragment which solves your problem. And the idea is not to have such a fragment. Okay. okay. So your goal is to come up with that fragment on your own. You never learn from uh, uh, looking at the solution. And, and it does not work anywhere. Like, you know, if you are learning how to prove theorems in mathematics and then you look at a lot of theorems, but okay. you don't know how to come up with a proof by yourself. Mm -hmm. You just you just you can remember, you can learn by heart how to how others prove theorems, but you don't prove them themselves. It's okay. the same with coding. If you look at a code example, you don't know how to write this code example. Even if you understand everything, like okay. when I was like when I was teaching students, and they told me, "Well, you know, of course, I copied this uh, from somewhere, but I, I understand everything." Mm -hmm. No, your goal is not to understand everything. Your goal is to be able to write your code by yourself. Especially, it's important when you are learning. So, uh, you need to uh, read books to get systematic knowledge, mm -hmm. to understand how to tackle problems using programming language. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it, it does not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a book. It can be a long tutorial, which explains yeah. your stuff. 
that's that's also okay of course it's not okay. about the form so building systematic knowledge of this area and then applying what you've learned to actually solving problems okay so okay. that is that is what is needed in all cases okay. when we are talking about learning okay so that, that reminds me about the conversation that we had with Pasha Finkenstein like several years ago when we discussed this conceptualization theory basically which states that you need to be introduced to some new terms like five or six not more because like your short-term memory cannot handle more, more than that and then you need to find the connections between those and then apply in practice the concepts that you just learned and only then you're learning some some incremental piece of, of new knowledge so basically when we're talking about like reading a book about the programming language what's important for me at least like that, that that's how i learned c or java or uh, javascript uh, those are two different ones um, so um, what i learned is that every book basically starts kind of with the data structures saying like hey this programming language operates with integers strings characters and what, whatever you have in the language and then you learn how to operate these things so how to concatenate a string for example or how to come uh, like how to sum two numbers then it introduces you to new things like functions and then here are the function properties and here are how you use it and then like step by step you build this uh body of knowledge that allows you to actually use the programming language so this is what you're talking about right like fu fundamental learning yes so you learn and then of course you apply as well it's it, it it's all known for 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 ages you've learned something you've applied it you solved some problems which were tailored specifically to this particular stuff that you've learned and then you learn something else on top of that of course it's iterative approach to learning so you have to read learn and then apply all the time otherwise it will be just useless uh, pile of sheet and not actual knowledge okay okay uh, okay imagine like i'm a like I, i'm a new developer i want to be a developer or i'm a seasoned developer already but i'm pursuing a high paying career in software development like what should i pick to you know find a high paying job is there any like language preferences uh, from what you see I don't know, Tiobi indexes or like uh, like survey reports or, or, or anything. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I don't think that there is a, well, there is some correlation between uh, programming languages and salaries. And if you look at, uh, for example, Stack Overflow developer survey, you will find some ideas there. But the problem is that uh, it it not it does not work in uh, individual cases. Like we know the statistics, but uh, it does not mean that you will get that uh, salary after learning this particular programming language. So it does not work in individual cases. So in in general, I think uh, it does not depend on the real programming language. Because if we are talking about careers in uh, software development, it seems that actually writing code uh, does not uh, take a lot of like many years. Like okay. you write code for five or six, maybe seven years, but okay. then you are a team lead and <laughs> you just do only meetings and you don't actually write code. You or maybe you are architect and then you come up with great ideas, but you don't implement them by yourself because you just don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. So and so it's not about programming language. Frankly. Okay, it's ju just a tool. From my experience, uh, the more impact uh, is lying around the location and I don't know a particular business rather than the programming language itself. So you can use Java for like different purposes or like do do things in Node.js and have like the salaries salary differences like five times if you're like comparing I don't know Europe to US, the US for example or like Spain to India or or other examples okay okay we, we touched this uh, like programming language um, 
indexes and developer surveys. Like when we were preparing for, for this talk, uh, we discovered, like uh, Vitaly shared that uh, you should not look at the TOB index at all because it's not representative. Can you elaborate on why? It is representative, but the, the question is what is represented in that survey? <laughs> okay. uh, th this, this, this index uh, actually shows how many people were looking uh, in Google for particular phrase like Python programming language or Python programming or Java programming. And then they compare number of folks and they just uh, assume that number of searches uh, correlate somehow with the popularity of programming language. But it's obviously and wrong. Uh, well, well, maybe. So if, if many I, I, I mean, people I mean, actually... I, I mean, it should uh, correlate more with like difficulty or uh, I don't know, like uh, learning curve of a programming language rather than number of people, right? Well, yes. And then if, if many people actually try to learn uh, Python and Python is like maybe simpler language than many others, so maybe it seems something, but uh, not in general. So I prefer looking at uh, developer surveys. And there are many surveys, actually. And I've already mentioned Stack Overflow. We at mm -hmm. JetBrains, we have also developer ecosystem survey. So we just try to reach uh, real software developers and ask them questions. And those questions uh, contains questions on uh, what programming language do you work with? Or maybe mm -hmm. what question do you want to learn as your next programming language? And then you can uh, think about how how developers move from one programming language to another. So those are more, more respectful uh, source of data. Of course, it's very difficult. Even for the, those uh, surveys, it's very difficult to deduce how many uh, actually developers in this or that programming language do we have. So you have to extrapolate somehow. I think I think for Stack Overflow survey, which is very popular, there are a lot of uh, uh, 80, 80,000 participants, okay. which is quite a lot. Yeah. And then and then they shows that seventy one percent of developers work with JavaScript. Oh my so god! So we can say that JavaScript is the most popular programming language. It does not mean that every other programming language fits into thirty. Because you mm -hmm. can choose several programming languages, of course. Okay, okay. And I, I played with that survey recently, and I figured out that 22 participants uh, just chose every programming language suggested. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of, about 50 programming languages there in that survey, and 22 people just choose everyone. 50? Uh, is, is it possible 50. to work with 50 programming languages? It's like 5-0, right? Five zero, yeah. Oh I, I don't God. think it's possible. So it just, just someone was playing with that survey. Okay, so that that was just for fun. Be, be, yeah, but still, the... I I believe the majority of uh, survey participants they answer like they they say truth in those surveys. Okay, so. okay. I, I I mean I remember teaching a new uh, learning a new language, right? And uh, then it became like a, a problem because you you could spend like half a year a year to have some at least some decency into what you're writing because like it's not only like writing a, a cycle or an if condition but it's rather have a maintainable code base that you can <laughs> later return to and, and improve so and that that's a that's a separate set of skills okay. you know i th i think that uh, in stack overflow so way uh there are five percent of developers who work with languages like C, C++, Java, Python, JavaScript. So these are popular languages and 5% work with like four of them or five of them. So 5% oh, okay. is quite a lot, actually. I think, yeah. I think if, well, it's, it's like thousands of people, but yeah. uh, more than that is too much, I believe. Yeah, I, I think you can easily come up with uh, technology stacks where you will need to do all of those. Like, for example, if you like take a, a typical enterprise application where you have a front end and it's like immediately react with JavaScript or TypeScript, 
then you would have some kind of a Java backend, right? Then you would probably will have some highly loaded ser critical service written in Rust or C in C++, or at least some libraries that will that will use that. And then, of course, you will have a database and then SQL modules and then probably an Nginx server. And then you would write some Lua modules for that. So like, it's if, if you're saying you're a full stack, right? Which is uh, which is rarely find found in enterprises, but uh, very um, very popular in small startups where you have a team like five developers and everybody is doing everything basically. Then it's yeah, sure, quite feasible. Yeah, but of course it's uh, it's very difficult to be an expert in every programming language that you yeah. use. So you can do something with it, but uh, you're not an expert. So, yeah. What is the release schedule for Cadence for for Java nowadays? Like, how frequently the changes happen? I think they they give like a couple of uh, releases every year. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. So that that that's the speed of changing. Like you you should yeah. constantly be keeping up in order to stay expert. Let's say. Yeah. So, so it, yeah. it's difficult to it's difficult to follow several programming languages, for example, because uh, number well Rust, for example, I think they 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 release I don't know maybe five releases a year, maybe even more. So it it changes very rapidly. Well, Rust is a little bit younger than than Java C plus so. plus. Yeah, but even even for C plus plus, so if it takes uh, two or three years to come up with a new standard, mm -hmm. then the the number of changes in that standard is overwhelming. So it takes exactly like two or three years to implement those changes, and then it takes the same yeah. amount of time to understand those changes. So you still. <laughs> don't have time like free time here so you have to learn yeah. all the all the time yeah that, that that's a problem okay uh let's talk about books right so you wrote uh, a haskell in depth so what did it take to to write a book about a programming language well i have i have an advice never to write a book about programming languages <laughs> why <laughs> Uh, well, it's a uh, it's very difficult job. So, um, and the the reward is is very small. And I'm not only talking about money. Of course, it's impossible to uh, to get a lot of money through writing books uh, unless your book is published in uh, like I don't know many editions and many programming languages and is bought by millions. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe. I, I, yeah, I think Martin Klepon was very successful with his data uh, designing data intensive applications. He shared that he learned like quite quite a bit, but it's not a programming language, right? And and it's in even then it's an exception. Of yeah. course, like we don't we don't have so many so popular books. So mm -hmm. just uh, just an exception in this world. I think I think in. Uh, in Java, there are more developers, or in Python, but then there are, there are a lot of books yeah. for people to choose from. So competition is very high there. Yeah, competition in Haskell is not very high, but then there are no many Haskell no, developers. No readers. <laughs> no readers. So so that's that's the problem. But yeah, wait, but, what about um, what, what about the ego? Like you know, being introduced into the podcast, like author of a book. I don't know. Uh, nothing special. I don't. I don't feel okay. anything. I, I remember okay. a lot of a lot of work. I, I remember uh, a lot of times when I didn't want to continue because it was too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of negative stuff is involved. I remember a lot of uh, not very pleasant reviews when people were saying that it's just just uh, some bullshit and nobody would read this. So. Yeah. A lot of negative stuff. So, wait, just... wait, what, what, what was the hardest thing about writing a book? Well, the hardest thing was to find time and to actually work, actually write. So you have, mm -hmm. you need to have a steady progress. You need to devote your time to this. You need to work consistently. You need to work regularly. 
and then you also need to have ideas and then you need to uh, come up with new ideas in a timely manner so it's impossible mm -hmm. to think for a month to to implement some some example than to describe it so it, it's uh, it's just very difficult it takes a lot of mm -hmm. time and then the and then maybe you can you're not uh, quite happy with what you got so you have to edit it you have to change something you have to rewrite it or maybe you wrote something and you're not happy with it you have to delete it and it's, it's also painful because those were your words but you have to delete them because they're not very good so but you spent a lot of time writing that so yeah sounds not a very pleasant <laughs> activity to no, me it's it's not pleasant at all it's not pleasant at all and, and then maybe you you can imagine that once you publish that book does everyone loves you everyone uh, knows about you you are so popular but that's not always the case so even so, even so. In, in Haskell community there are all the fo folks who don't know me who don't know this book so that's oh just, really okay I, I thought you would you would go out on the street just with a with a set of pens to write, write down the autographs <laughs> no no that I am not Martin Klepman unfortunately so, <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we already got one so like why 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 have several uh okay but what 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 what's the best thing about like being an author um it uh well <laughs> funny thing it uh, allows you to learn everything about language you're writing about okay and that's that's actually a very good thing like you can use uh, teaching to learn programming mm -hmm. languages and writing a book is also very useful when you want to learn something mm -hmm. And uh, you just, uh, I can't imagine how many uh, things I didn't understand before I actually attempt to write a book about that. Okay. So it's a very nice tool for learning something. Okay. Now, now, now you do. Okay. Yeah, that, that's basically uh, one of the motivation why I started the channel, right? So like I, I wanted to, to read this database internal book. But it was very hard and then i decided okay in order to understand it i need to explain it so mm -hmm. like when i started recording those those videos uh basically the, the video about like how how databases store data on disks is the most popular on the channel it still gets like a significant amount of views uh and yeah like i, I learned a lot like how these b trees work and how like it can be stored how the uh recalibration of trees work so that 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 was very insightful Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, Alex Alex Petrov, right? Uh, yeah, the author yeah. of that book. It, this book is really great. I love it so much. And uh, in many cases, like, well, in some topics, it's it, it's so brilliantly written. So I, I know that there are a lot of folks out there, like reading clubs for for this book. And this is really nice uh, writing. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I admire Alex a lot. Yeah. yeah, people writing reviews. Yeah, I, I want to invite him for a session as well. So hopefully, I will. I will. Uh, he has DMs open, but I am a little bit frightened of of writing because he would see my 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 uh, my, my my videos and say, "Hey, you completely messed up there. <laughs> like, it's not how you're explaining." <laughs> Well, I think I think that's that's normal, and every author understands it. Uh, so, well, you can write something, but then someone understands it indifferently, and maybe mm -hmm. it's your problem, maybe it's their problem, but it happens. That's normal. Okay, okay. So, yeah, folks, read books. They're, they're very powerful, right? Okay, uh, I I think that's. Uh, um... Let's spend the last like five, seven minutes of our time, uh, you know, talking about advices. Like uh, we're relatively senior, I think, with Vitaly today because like I have like 15 years, I think, in the in in IT. So there are a lot of young folks uh, coming in. So what is your biggest, I don't know, learning in your career? Like as you learned the, the languages, as you taught the languages, like your biggest advice. Uh, well, you you have to understand that uh, it's your responsibility uh, to to learn. It's no one else's responsibility. 
So if you learn something, try to do it for real. It's not just uh, about coming with a solution, coming up with a solution. It's about uh, getting a systematic knowledge. And I've told that several times already uh, uh, here. So you have to build your own system. So that is extremely important. So you, it, it's not about acquiring skills. It's about building a system, mental system, which uh, explains what's going on in every area. So I recommend that. That was my first advice. Build a system of knowledge and you are and only you responsible for building it. And then, of course, you can uh, continue extending that system or maybe you can uh, learn something totally different. But with systematic with this systematic approach, you will be successful uh, no matter what, no matter the area you choose, uh, no matter the particular thing, ideas. Try to build the system. Okay. And once you achieve that, you will have a nice bald head. <laughs> well, it's, it's not necessarily. You can you, you can have your hairs. No problem at all. No problem. Uh, okay. Okay. What is uh, the most enjoyable book you have read like in the last two years about like programming languages or IT in general? Hmm. Uh, uh, because of my uh, current work, uh, I, I read a lot of uh, books uh, about Rust because okay. uh, I work with Rust Trova, our uh, ID for Rust. Uh, and then there was a really great book which is called... Uh, I, I don't remember... Uh, the, the author is Mara Boss, and uh, she's, uh, I think she's um, library team lead for Rust programming language. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, she wrote a book about um, locks, concurrent programming, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it's, it's a book about Rust, about doing concurrent programming in Rust, but it is so much more than uh, Rust. She was going into a lot of details about... Um, how things work on the CPU level, for example, how they okay. work with memory. Like uh, she explains memory models in great detail and in a very understandable way. So if you are writing concurrent code in any programming language, mm -hmm. I I recommend reading this Mara Boss book. Okay, so okay. She's, she's a really great teacher. And, uh, and the book is available for free on your website actually no way no way okay knowledge yeah, it, for free. Was, it was published by o'reilly but uh, still it's available for free on the web page mm -hmm. uh, something and locks i don't remember maybe maybe we can uh, add the 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 title and the link to the description yeah, yeah so sure we'll, we'll, yeah we will have it down down below of course yeah so but and this is very important because you are talking about programming language but then you understand that your code is executed on the actual uh, hardware. And you have to mm -hmm. understand that as well if you're working with concurrent applications. And this bridge is very important. And of course, you can you can read uh, very thick books about computer architecture. But then you won't get any real knowledge about writing code for those platforms. True. And this True. book uh, is very good in explaining the the connection between these two so yeah, yeah i recommend it a lot. maybe maybe that was my best impression uh, of that yeah and Thank then by much. the way an, another example uh recently i became very interested in uh history of uh programming well i was interested with history mm -hmm. of programming for many years actually history of programming languages but now i am into other lovelies and her works on okay. uh, uh programming for analytical machine, Babbage's analytical machine. And it's also very insightful to learn about programming 200 years ago. Okay. So, yeah, may maybe something will come up out of this interest of me. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. 
Uh, yeah, speaking about concurrency, I remember back in my days, uh, I was having difficulties wrapping around this memory models and the talks by Alexei Shepelov was very, very useful from that regard. So yeah, reading a book about that, I, I would love to do that as well. You know what, be before, before listening to Shepelov's talk, you have to learn something. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> this, this book I was talking about is a good step before listening okay. to his talks. Okay, good, good prerequisite. Okay, then sure, we will definitely have it in the description down below. So it, like you should be watching this in the recording. So it should be available. Just go click and read it. Educate yourself finally. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Like we're running out of time. Uh, I was enjoying this a lot and uh, learned several, several big things today. So thanks Vitaly for doing this and yeah, see you next time. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.